like uh, Chaucer's Pilgrims here with the nine of us. There were more than nine in Chaucer's um, uh, Canterbury Tales. And that's an important work in my life, as, as I'll mention here. My, the through line of my presentation tonight is uh, the unexpected reveals treasures we're unaware of. The unexpected. <clears throat> life can be like Pandora's box, actually. Um, indeed, <clears throat> um, inside can be unexpected treasures if we're uh, curious enough to open it. And of course, you know that sometimes when you open Pandora's box, you don't know what's coming out. More than likely, it's going to be some scourge of some kind. Yeah. Uh, well, but my life has not been scourge-ridden at all. I've opened that box many times, and out of that box has come some incredible, incredible uh, inspirations or perhaps um, uh, epiphanies. Uh, and one of them is, is an important part of my, my talk right now. I had such a moment in the summer of uh, 1969, 48 years ago, when I was 43. I'll be 92 my next birthday. And yes, I was a, a Marine Corps sergeant during World War II and got out of the Marine Corps out of the service in 1946 and had uh, I worked in the steel mills of Pittsburgh for a number of years and some of the worst jobs you can imagine, actually, until I realized that, that I needed an education. And so I, uh, in 1948, when I was 22 and realized that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in the steel mills. I only had one year of high school. I dropped out of ninth grade to go to, to join the Marine Corps. And besides, I was already two years over age in, in, my, in my cohort. And so <clears throat> when, I, when I went to first grade in San Antonio, the schools of San Antonio were segregated. Uh, there were only there were the, the, the white schools, the Mexican schools, and the Indian, uh, the white schools, Mexican, white schools, black schools, and the Mexican slash Indian schools. And so in the independent school district that I went to, uh, most, of us, most of us spoke Spanish. And so we, we were faced with teachers who only spoke English. And so because of that, I repeated the first grade twice. I almost made a major out of it. And uh, <clears throat> then and when I went and got to the fourth grade, English was the toughest subject for me. I still couldn't get the hang of the English language uh, by the fourth grade, so they held me back again. So uh, when I went to college, I majored in English and took the PhD in English. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, three years earlier, in 1966, when I was 40, I had been accepted as a PhD student at the University of New Mexico, <clears throat> and uh, with uh, intent of uh, completing a dissertation on Chaucer, uh, I had finished. I had written a master's thesis on Hamlet, so I, I became enamored of English literature. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, let's see. Uh, by 1969, I had completed the PhD coursework in English and had passed my comprehensive exam for the PhD. Um, it so happened that that, um, that summer of 69, Louis Bransford was appointed by the University of New Mexico as the director, first director of the Chicano Studies Program in the state of New Mexico. That was 1969. I was the only um, Hispanic in the English department at the time as a teaching fellow on leave from the from New Mexico State University where I, where I had been assistant professor of English. <clears throat> so in 1969, that uh, summer, early summer, Bransford asked if I could organize a course in Mexican American literature. Sure, I said. I, I created all kinds of courses. So I set about to put the course together, and I discovered that there were no ex materials extant enough for a course for the students who had signed up. About 80 students had signed up for the course. 
<clears throat> but uh, I did the best I could. I scoured uh, libraries, got a lot of stuff from personal writers and mimeographs. Some of you may not know what that is, but mimeo <laughs> mimeograph a lot of material for my students. Well, we got through that course, but I tell you what, it altered my life because in January, I went to the chair of the Department of English, uh, Joe Zabdell, and I said, Joe, I want to change my dissertation topic. What? Are you crazy? You got three chapters written on Jaws already. You just need one more. <laughs> well, uh, he relented, and I set about then to change my dissertation topic. I had to find three new people who were going to be my committee. One of those members lives here in Silver City, the chair of that committee. Uh, he was much younger than me. I've always been the oldest in any group. <laughs> Am I the oldest here? <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, forgive me for a moment. I'm having a senior moment. Uh, what's your well? Oh, uh, Joseph, uh, Louis Bransford wanted me to do create that course in Mexican American literature. Chicano, the word Chicano was on the back burner. It was not a a a, a, a an au courant term at the time. You know. But uh, so uh, I would have completed my my Chaucer dissertation in May uh, by May of seventy, and I would have gotten this. PhD then, but changing my dissertation topic, uh, I didn't get the PhD until, 19, until May of 1971, a year later. What I did then, as my contribution to the counterculture, was to write a dissertation on backgrounds of Mexican-American literature, the first study in the field. No one had ever stopped to think about this, this these 300, these, these, uh, uh, yeah, 300 million people that, no, not 300 million, 3 million people that had come with the territory, uh, the territory of the Mexican session. Yeah, but they had a, an extensive literature from 1848 to 1969, 1970. And so um, I feel gratified that I wrote the first study in the field that gave us a literary history of Mexican-American writers. Yeah. Out of that came then an essay that I did called The Chicano Renaissance, which no, no academic journal would publish. It was finally published by Social Casework in May of 1971 in New York City. It has, it has become a keystone article in the study of Mexican-American and Chicano literature. One of my books, one of my, the first anthology, critical anthology of Mexican American literature is on the, sh on the table over there that I did for Simon and Schuster. And uh, by way of, <laughs> uh, my life was changed considerably, and that was my contribution to the counterculture.